Now you're listening to Classical Cambridgeshire with me, Anna Lapwoods, on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. Handel's Messiah is one of his best-known works, and you would think that we know all of his music pretty well by now. It seems almost impossible that he could have written major works that we don't know as well. But the Brockers' passion isn't anywhere near as familiar in this country. It's also nowhere near as well known as Bach's passions. But why don't we know this work as well? Is it as good as the Bach passions that it inspired? The Academy of Ancient Music have made a new recording of the work to mark the anniversary of its first performance. And Mark met up with Alexander van Ingen, their chief executive in London. He began by asking what the Brockers' passion actually is. Uh, this is the great Handel's setting uh, of the Passion story. Um, we all we know the Passion story, the great uh, Easter religious story, um, and we're, everyone's very familiar with the Bark Passions, the Saint John and the Saint Matthew. And Bark has a bit of a monopoly on Passion season, but he shouldn't have because Handel wrote a Passion, the Brockers Passion, and it is superb. And he wrote it many years before Bark did. In fact, the Handel, the work by Handel, is what inspired Bark to write the Saint John Passion in the first place. Bark so loved this work by Handel, he copied the thing out by hand and performed it in Leipzig himself. So this Brockers Passion by Handel um, is an enormously important work, but it's also absolutely magnificent. Um, it's not well known in the UK, it's better known in Germany, probably partly because it, it is in German. Um, the libretto is set by one of Germany's foremost poets, uh, Bartold Heinrich Brockers. Um, and whereas Bach takes uh, the, a gospel story, the St. Saint, the Saint John telling the story of the St. Matthew, and tells that through music, Brockers uh, freely paraphrases from all four gospels. Um, he versifies, he amplifies, and he dramatizes. And it's a really strong and dramatic telling of the Passion story. And Handel responds with all his ability as a dramatist and a colorist in amazingly moving arias, powerful choruses, and so much more. I, I suppose the, the first question to ask a bit about that actual text, uh, rather than sticking strictly to one of those Gospels, which then, in a way, ring fences you in, in terms of the story. It creates enormous opportunities uh, for character development. Um, and one of the things Handel does is to, is to follow the development of characters that we hear very little about uh, in the Bach passions. So uh, Judas, for example. Peter doesn't just deny Christ thrice. He comes back with another aria more when he realises what he's done, full of remorse and anguish. Uh, he sings uh, about um, wanting his bowels to feel as though they're over hot coals. Um, such uh, is the sin he feels he's committed. Um, and Judas, having mentioned him, uh, likewise, uh, there's an aria for him after uh, he's given, yeah, after he's betrayed Christ, uh, there's an aria for him where he, in a similar fashion, realizes what he's done and how terrible a thing it is that he's done. Uh, there's a duet for for Mary and Jesus, for for mother and son, which is something Bach would never have dared to do. It's far too personal uh, for the Son of God, um, but Handel dares to do it because Handel is a a great portrayer of human emotion and of how we feel and and how they feel. Um, and there are uh, some allegorical characters to the, the biggest role in, in the Brockers' Passion is that of the Daughter of Zion, uh, superbly sung in this recording by Elizabeth Watts. Um, and she has about 52 minutes of material across the piece, which is an enormous thing. Her role is really to respond to events in the way in which we might respond, uh, either today or then, uh, or how people might have responded at the time. Uh, so Handel and Brockers are able to introduce this element of added drama because of, of the free versification of the text, because they're allowed to dive into who these people are and what makes them tick. With, with the Bark Passions being so well known and, and this now suddenly appearing in, in this musical history, were these kind of grand scale settings common in that period of music? They were hugely common. This, this libretto by Brockers was enormously popular at the time. Uh, it's set by, we think, no fewer than at least 12 composers, possibly 13, made musical settings of this same text. The text was reprinted 30 different times just by 1727. So within 10 years or so of this passion being performed, they'd reprinted the text 30 times. It was so popular and so direct uh, and spoke to people at the time uh, in a way that perhaps that story hadn't been told before. Uh, it was performed numerous times uh, right across Germany and, and outside, uh, e even in, in Stockholm. Um, and in our new recording there's a, a multi-page list of all the performances we know of, and certainly in Hamburg, in the refectory building to the cathedral, where the Handel Brockers Passion was first uh, performed, was premiered 300 years ago this year, 1719, uh, they 
often ran uh, events where they performed four composer settings of the same work back to back. Uh, so the Telemann, the Handel, the Matheson and the Kaiser. Uh, Kaiser ran the Opera House in, in Hamburg, Matheson ran the Cathedral, Telemann and the Handel both great composers and friends of the other two men. Um, and they performed almost like a festival performance or um, sort of a, a bit like a, a passion bake-off, uh, if you will, um, performing them night after night. So members of the public could go to one or, or all four and compare and contrast how the different composers dealt with the story and set exactly the same text. Is it possible for us to say in any way why this one has not retained the same level of importance in this country as, as the, the Barks have and the same regularity of performance? Um, I think it is. And I, I think it's partly because at the time it was written, which, as I say, is you know, a good ten years plus earlier than the Bark Passions, uh, England had a new and German king. The Jacobites were busy threatening to have a revolution, and performing works in German was not really a thing that we did uh, in England. Handel was busy writing Italian opera for the stage and, and works in English. Um, so the work wouldn't have made it to England at the time it was written. Um, and by the time German became a more acceptable language to perform art and, and culture in, we were entering the Edwardians and then the Victorians. Uh, and by that time, uh, we had you know, a very strong sensibilities about what was appropriate and what was not appropriate. And the sort of visceral blood and guts and gory language that Brockers uses was very much the sort of thing uh, that, that our Edwardian and Victorian forebears would have, would have turned their noses up at and, and said, well, dear me, that's, that's, really, that's really not quite the sort of thing for us. Um, it's just, it's far too gory and, and visceral. Um, and whereas the, the Bark Passions more relate the story in a still in a in a, a very emotional way, but but quite a plain way, um, and I think that's probably the, the the best reason we can think of as to why this work isn't better known in the UK, but it is reasonably well known in in Germany. That was Mark talking to Alexander van Ingen from the Academy of Ancient Music about their new release of Handel's Brockes Passion. We'll be finding out more about the work that went into bringing this recording about and how local choirs could be performing it as early as next year. That's coming up straight after the latest on the roads. Across Cambridgeshire. BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. <laughs> That was the daughter of Zion singing the aria Meine Laster Zindischlicker. And the daughter there was performed by Elizabeth Watts. 
You're listening to Classical Cambridgeshire with me, Anna Lapwood, on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. And that was an extract from the new recording of Handel's Brockus Passion, which has been recorded by the Academy of Ancient Music to mark the 300th anniversary of the piece's performance. Despite being by Handel, the piece is not very well known in this country, and the Academy are looking to bring it to a wider audience. But how do you put together the definitive version of a work that was first performed 300 years ago? Mark has been talking to the Academy's chief executive, Alexander Van Ingen, to find out. Um, before we actually cut forward to the, the 21st century and uh, the, the current recordings and performances, look, looking at this kind of work, are there other similar kind of gaps where you'd have major composers who've performed works which might be significant in other countries but have not made it to this one? Is there much left in terms of musical history of this period for us to still find and to explore? I'm absolutely certain that there is. Um, it's a bit hard to know what we don't know, um, if you see what I mean. But certainly when you look at the, the Brockers' passions alongside Handel, we don't know the Telemann particularly well, we don't know the Kaiser, we don't know the Matheson, the Sturzel either. Uh, and th- those are probably the, the big four other than Handel. And there, as I say, there are plenty of others. And some of the others have only ever been recorded once, some have never been recorded. Um, and uh, they're certainly worthwhile looking at. But I, I think it's fair to say that the Handel is the best of the bunch. And I'm absolutely certain that there's more of this around. But it takes time to find it. And, and actually, as more libraries, particularly across Eastern Europe, are starting to open up and welcome in researchers and investigators from other countries, I've no doubt that much more of this sort of repertoire will suddenly come to light. So let's, let's cut forward to the 21st century then, and uh, this, this particular piece. How long has this been in gestation, uh, actually coming together as a project? It, you could argue it's up to 30 years. I mean, Richard Egar first came across Handel's Brockers Passion when he was a student in Cambridge um, at Clare College some 30-odd years ago. Uh, he found a reference to it. Um, he looked at a, an edition that was around at the time uh, and thought it was absolutely wonderful and amazing and put it in the back of his mind as something he would like to perform one day. Fast forward to maybe two and a half years ago or so when I joined the Academy of Ancient Music and I, Rich and I were talking about repertoire and he mentioned this piece and to my shame I had no idea that Handel had written A Passion nor that it was such an amazing piece of music and uh, together we took a look at it. We realised that 1719 uh, was it, the date of its first known performance and therefore 2019 would be a, a 300 year anniversary. Um, uh, so we thought what better year to bring it back, revive it and celebrate it in than this year uh, and on Good Friday at Easter we put on a performance on Good Friday so it was that's 300 years to the liturgical week uh, exactly from its first known performance uh, in, in Hamburg uh, and around that uh, we set out, uh, having realised that the last time the score was given a critical going over was 1965 by Berenreiter and since then, new sources have come to light. Uh, new manuscripts have been, have been found in different collections that shed a slightly different light on it to the, the approach they took. Uh, so we've spent the last two years making a brand new edition of, of the music. The original manuscript is, is long lost, hasn't been around for, for a long time. Um, Handel posted it off to his friend, uh, to Matheson in Hamburg, uh, to be performed in 1719 and never saw it again. Uh, as, as far as we know. So we set out uh, making our, our own edition for some 15 sources in 11 collections, nine cities and five countries by the time we'd found, found them all. Um, and we've created what we think is now the most definitive, the most complete version that, that there is. And, and where there are differences, where we've come across recits or choruses in different settings, in different sources, uh, we've recorded both versions and we include a whole CD of appendices for, for these versions that, that may or may not be. Uh, so as, as a listener, you can make up your own mind. It's actually, I prefer the manuscript from, from Stockholm or from Budapest, and it, that aria should be with flutes instead of oboes, so I prefer the bit on the appendices. Um, and our aim really is to, is to give that control to the listener and to say, if, if you think it should be this way or that way, here's everything, and you can make your own mind up. It reminds me of my Choose Your Own Adventure books I used to read as a child, and it turned to page 30 or 70, depending on which decision it was. I suppose the question is, how can you be uh, in any way certain about what, what Handel's intentions would have been uh, 300 years hence? You can never know, of course, uh, and somebody like Handel, who was forever inventing and reinventing, um, you never know which way he, he would have swung on, on anything, really. But we've taken the best available scholarship. We've worked with a variety of, of scholars on this project from the universities of Cambridge, Oxford, uh, King's College London, the Open University, um, as well as people like Richard Egar and the score editor, Leo Duarte, who's also our principal oboe. 
um, who are you know, experts in their, in their field. Um, and we've come up with what we all agree um, and we think is, is the best that, that we can do. But um, in, in the book that accompanies this, this CD set, it's a, a fairly substantial 220-page book, um, uh, we identify all the sources and where they are. Uh, we give a, a running commentary on what we thought about them. So there's a way to unpick what our process was and why we have performed it with the size of orchestra we have, why we have the size of choir we have, uh, why we don't think that it's one voice to a part in the bar. Leipzig way, why we think it's, it's bigger, because we know that at that time Handel was writing things for larger forces with up to you know, 22 violins, 14 cellos, quite large orchestras, even as early as 1708. Um, and then through to 1722, he was performing pieces for large orchestras. So it's entirely conceivable that this piece could have been uh, done with a, a, larger, a larger ensemble, and we think it works well dramatically, it works well musically. Um, it certainly fits with other things Handel was writing at the time. Um, but, but as you allude to, all these, in a way, all these are guesses. They're educated guesses, but they are guesses, because um, uh, until somebody finds a bill or a set of payment receipts to musicians in 1719, we, we don't know how many there were. Uh, but we can use all the information we can find um, from libraries around the world, particularly in Hamburg, in Munich, in Berlin, and, and there's a lot of um, evidence in the British Library in London, to find out as much as we can about it and put it all together to result in this, this major uh, recording project for the Academy of Ancient Music. That was Mark talking to Alexander van Ingen from the Academy of Ancient Music about their new release of Handel's Brocker's Passion. And when Mark spoke to Alexander, he picked out a couple of movements that really stood out during the process of studying and recording the music. And one of them was this aria by Judas, which comes towards the end of the first half. <laughs> was Tim Mead performing the role of Judas in Handel's Brocker's Passion. And you're listening to Classical Cambridgeshire with me, Anna Lapwoods, on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. Now, this week, our reporter, Mark Liversidge, has been finding out about the Academy of Ancient Music's new recording of that piece, The Brocker's Passion. But it's not just about the recording. The Academy are also looking to offer the chance for people to actually perform the work themselves. Before that, Mark asked Alexander van Ingen, their chief executive, more about the process of actually putting this whole thing together. It feels as if the, the detective process of putting this all together is almost as enjoyable as the, when it comes to the actual performance of it. Uh, it certainly has been for me. Um, I, I think sleuthing around libraries and manuscripts is absolutely fascinating. So you, you never quite know what you're going to uncover. Um, and then when you do uncover something, uh, it's a really wonderful feeling. Or when you, uh, the, the opening, we've put an extra 63 bars back on the very start of this work, um, which the Berenreiter edition in 1965 omits, um, because it's the same it's the same tune, it's the same melody that, that Handel uses in a work much later in the 1740s, I think. Um, so they thought that that had been 
retro-added back to the front of Brockers and wasn't real. What we were able to find out was that from a different collection of scores that Ben Reiter didn't know about in the 60s, we can date a later collection of scores very much to around the time that we think Brockers' Passion was, was written uh, by, by virtue of the paper and the watermarking and so on. And this set of scores, uh, the um, Elizabeth Lee collection, uh, the, the Malmesbury papers, um, has this 63 bars on the front. So it must have started in Brockers' Passion and he then pinched it from there and used it to write something, you know, 20, 30 years later, not the other way around. And it's finding out little things like that. We can, actually, we can, we can prove that, that, that those notes definitely existed at this time because that paper only existed at, at that time or has the watermark. Um, and they're, they're small things, they're, they're small pleasures. Um, but when you start to, to piece them together and then you realise how it works musically as a, as a form because of the little things you found out, um, it's very satisfying. And it's one of the things we take very seriously at the Academy of Ancient Music, this idea of exploring archives and finding, um, I was going to say finding new things. I mean, they're, they're not new because it's 300 years old, uh, but it's new to us and it's new to our understanding of either this piece or whatever other piece it might be um, and I think that's absolutely fascinating. And we've spoken about the past of this music and the present, uh, but there is a future of this music to consider as well of course uh, that not only have you put this together uh, as a recording, but also for the potential for other groups to be involved in it We're extremely keen that this piece gets out to the, the widest audience it can and that's not just about people listening to our recording of it, but having made this new edition of, of the score um, we'll be making that available from early next year for anybody um, to, to download uh, online, uh, whether you're a listener and you want to, to follow the score, a scholar that wants to investigate it, or whether you're a performing group professional or amateur, anywhere uh, in the world and you want to perform it and it, we recognise that you know we can't be everywhere and we can't perform this piece in every country all the time because we're physical people and we can only be in one place at a time but we would love people to get to know this piece much better and if, if you're an amateur choral society and you maybe you don't want to do the whole piece but you just want to sing through the choruses on a, on a Tuesday night you're more than welcome to have the music there's you know, there's no higher charge, no nothing, please uh, download it and, uh, and put on a performance in Australia or in Peru or in Moscow or in Ekaterinburg and uh, you know, anywhere you like. Um, the important thing for us is that having invested an enormous amount of time and you know, therefore money in this exercise of, of scholarship to recreate this piece and put it down um, is now that everybody should have access to it. And yes, you can listen to our recording, but actually we also list in our CD, in, in the book, in the CD booklet, um, we list the other recordings of this work uh, that you could also listen to that you might be interested in, both the ones from the, the 60s, from the 80s, and, and more recently, because actually other people will perform it in a different way. And we're very open to the idea that as a listener, you might want to hear it done by different people in, in different ways. Um, so we've provided all that information as well. But it's really, it's about the score, and this is a new thing for the Academy of Ancient Music, that over the next few years we want to discover more works like this and make the scores available so that everybody has a chance to perform from the inside as a youth orchestra, um, as an amateur orchestra, as a professional orchestra, to perform this work and discover it for themselves. Uh, so if any choral societies or other groups out there are thinking about their Easter 2021 programmes, that's probably the, the next window of guessing that people may not have planned, what sort of forces would they be looking to try and get together to perform a work like this? Uh, the Handel's Brockers Passion is actually relatively modest in terms of forces. It's a, a string group, um, and the reason the it's kind of basic wind group, pair of oboes, pair of bassoons. Um, it doesn't need brass, doesn't need percussion. Uh, and of course, it, it, it being a baroque work, it needs a, a continuo section, so a harpsichord, a chamber organ, a uh, theorbo, if you, if you have one, would, you know, is a nice addition. Uh, but actually, the, the forces are not huge. They're not enormous. Uh, they're, they're very sensible. It needs a chorus, and it needs a range of soloists. The soloists can happily come from within the chorus, the role of the Daughter of Zion is uh, an enormous one, but uh, it's often performed with two people covering it because it's such a, an enormous uh, soprano role. And in the way we've done it, we have nine soloists plus a couple of extras stepping out of the choir. But it, it could be done. It could be done with, you know, nine or ten soloists who also form the chorus as well as singing the solo lines. I think there are a lot of different ways of dividing it up, uh, and it doesn't really matter to a certain extent how you divide it up. I, I think so long as people get the opportunity to hear the music itself. So really, the chance for, for uh, choirs out there to take this work and make it their own? Absolutely, uh, and I hope that very many uh, choirs, orchestras, soloists and others um, enjoy experiencing the Academy of Ancient Music's um, you know, reading of Handel's Brockers Passion, uh, but more than that, that they would enjoy making it as music themselves.
That was Mark talking to Alexander van Ingen from the Academy of Ancient Music about their new release of Handel's Brocke's Passion. That's coming out on October the 4th. And it, I have to say, I've got it in the studio with me here. It comes with a rather marvellous 220-page booklet with new artwork and the full history of the recording. You get that if you buy the physical recording of the CD. It's also going to be available to download and the free score will be made available to download next year. You're listening to Classical Cambridgeshire with me, Anna Lapwoods, on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. The Academy of Ancient Music aren't just a recording ensemble. They continue to perform live using instruments that are faithful to the Baroque period. And their next concert is in London next week at the Barbican. I really, really, really wish I could go. It features another rarely performed work. Do Sex Mass in G, and the overture and incidental music to Beethoven's Egmont, which will be narrated by Stephen Fry, one of the reasons that I really want to go. Now, while the whole work is also not often performed, you may be more familiar with the overture. (laughs) 